This airworthiness lesson focuses on the inspections required for an airplane to be considered airworthy. The Memory Aid Aviates is a useful tool for quickly recalling and organizing the required inspections that you, the PIC, are responsible for verifying before you fly. Aviates stands for Annual Inspection, VOR Inspection, 100 Hour, Altimeter, Transponder, ELT, and Static System Inspections. In this lesson, we'll look at each inspection and how you can use the ATP Airworthiness Checklist and Maintenance Logs to verify that your airplane has all of the required inspections. We'll start with the annual. 91409 states that no person may operate an aircraft unless within the preceding 12 calendar months it's had an annual inspection. In other words, if the airplane hasn't had an annual in the preceding 12 months, you can't fly it. The PIC is responsible for determining whether an annual has been accomplished and that an appropriately qualified A&P mechanic with an inspection authorization has returned the airplane to service. An annual inspection is very thorough. It helps determine the airplane's overall condition, safety for flight, and compliance with required inspections, ADs, and other airworthiness criteria. An annual inspection and a 100-hour inspection are very similar with a few key exceptions. An annual inspection occurs every 12 calendar months, whereas a 100-hour inspection occurs every 100 hours of service. A certified airframe and power plant mechanic, A&P, can perform a 100-hour inspection and authorize the aircraft's return to service. Only the holder of an inspection authorization, or an IA, can authorize the aircraft's return to service following an annual inspection. Appendix D to Part 43 contains a list of items required for both the annual and 100-hour inspections. It's a comprehensive list that covers virtually every square inch of the airplane. In ATP airplanes, pilots can find the annual inspection records in the airframe section of the blue Pilot's Maintenance Logbook located in the back of each airplane. As maintenance pages are added to the logbook, they're added to the back of each appropriate section, so the most recent inspections can usually be found toward the back. To find the most recent annual inspection, flip through the yellow maintenance logs and scan through the logbook entries to find the text that indicates an annual inspection was completed. Once you've found the annual inspection, you can verify the date, end number, serial number, and the signature by an appropriately qualified A&P mechanic with an inspection authorization. Once you've found the most recent annual, mark the date of the inspection and the next due date on your ATP Airworthiness Checklist. Since the regulations specify calendar months, the month and year will suffice when calculating the next due date. In this example, a pilot may not operate the airplane past the last day of April 2009, since the most recent annual was conducted in April of 2008. As long as today's date is on or before the next annual inspection due, flights can legally be conducted in compliance with 91409A. The due date you calculate should match the next due column on the Aircraft and Equipment Inspection Guide located in the front of the blue pilot's maintenance logbook. If it doesn't, there's a discrepancy between the inspection you used for your calculation and the one maintenance used. This warrants further investigation and you shouldn't depart until you can be sure you're interpreting the inspection data correctly and can verify all required logbook entries are present and correct. Even though ATP maintenance personnel calculate these numbers to assist with your planning, it's still your responsibility as PIC to verify the airplane is airworthy and has all of the appropriate airworthiness inspections. Examiners and FAA inspectors may require you to demonstrate that the airplane is airworthy by locating and interpreting the actual inspections in the Blue Maintenance Logbook as opposed to simply referencing the Aircraft and Equipment Inspection Guide. In other words, you may have to prove how the numbers and dates on the Aircraft and Equipment Inspection Guide were generated. Once you've concluded that the airplane has had an annual within the last 12 calendar months, you can check the annual inspection box complete and continue to verify the status of the other required inspections. If it hasn't had an annual in the previous 12 months, you'll need to find another airplane to fly or get a special permit issued by the FAA. The next inspection is the VOR inspection. The VOR inspection is required if the planned flight will be conducted under instrument flight rules. According to 91171, in order to legally operate an IFR flight, a check of the airplane's VOR equipment must have been accomplished in the preceding 30 days, and a record of the check must be kept. 
Pilots are authorized to accomplish the VOR operational check and to record the following information in the aircraft log or other record. The place that the VOR check was conducted, the signature of the person conducting the check, the date, and the bearing error. A good memory aid for the information that must be included in the VOR log or record is please sign the darn book, PSDB, for place, signature, date, and bearing error. In ATP airplanes, there's a VOR equipment log located in the first few pages of the Blue Pilot's Maintenance Logbook. If there's no record indicating a VOR check occurred within the past 30 days, you must accomplish and log a VOR check in accordance with 91171. There are several ways to accomplish a VOR equipment check. You can conduct the check by using an approved FAA VOR test facility, also known as a VOT, by using a certified VOR system checkpoint on an airport surface, by using a certified airborne checkpoint, by completing an airborne VOR check using a prominent landmark along a VOR airway, or by completing a dual VOR check which compares one VOR against another if your airplane is equipped with two VOR receivers. With all of the options available to conduct a VOR check, completing the check should be fairly easy to accomplish regardless of where the airplane is located. You can find a list of VOR test facilities and VOR checkpoints in a dedicated section of the AFD. There are separate sections for VOT facilities and VOR receiver checkpoints for each state. Each section lists the frequencies, radials, DME distances, and distinguishes whether the checkpoints are on the ground or airborne. Once you've completed the VOR check and confirmed it's within limits, log it in the VOR equipment check record and mark the VOR check complete on the airworthiness checklist. The next inspection in the AV8's checklist is the 100-hour inspection. 91409B says no person may operate an aircraft for hire or may give flight instruction for hire in an aircraft which that person provides. That's a key distinction, who provides or supplies the airplane, unless the aircraft has, within the preceding 100 hours, received an annual or 100-hour inspection. Let's take a closer look. Some examples of for hire operations that would require a 100-hour inspection include aerial photography, or flight instruction flights where the school or instructor provides the aircraft. Most flight schools, for instance, would be subject to the 100-hour requirement because they provide both the airplane and the instructor. An aircraft provided by a student pilot is not subject to the 100-hour rule. So if an individual wants to receive instruction in their own airplane, they can do so without having to have a 100-hour inspection. If an annual inspection was conducted in the previous 100 hours, or if an airworthiness certificate was issued within the previous 100 hours, a separate 100 hour inspection is not required. In other words, if 100 hours due at the same time as an annual, the annual can be completed and both requirements would be met. Another example would be a new airplane with an airworthiness certificate issued in the previous 100 hours. This airplane does not also need a 100 hour inspection. Like all inspections, the PIC is responsible for determining whether the 100-hour inspection has been accomplished within the last 100 hours of service. So what does a 100-hour inspection inspect? A 100-hour inspection is very similar to an annual inspection, except that it occurs every 100 hours of service instead of every 12 calendar months. An A&P mechanic can conduct a 100-hour inspection and approve the aircraft's return to service. An A&P with an IA is not required to return the aircraft to service following a 100-hour. Let's take a look at how to determine when the next 100-hour inspection is due. This isn't as straightforward as you may think, and calculating the next 100-hour can be tricky. True or false, to determine when the next 100-hour inspection is due, simply add 100 to the Hobbs time of the previous 100-hour inspection. This always works, right? Not exactly. The only way to be sure and accurately calculate the next 100-hour inspection is to evaluate the two most recent 100-hour inspections. Here's why. Adding 100 to the most recent inspection will work in most cases, but not all cases. 91409B says the 100-hour limitation may be exceeded by as much as 10 hours while en route to a place where the inspection can be completed. Any overage, however, must be included when computing the next 100 hours of service. 
So it's possible that a 100-hour inspection can be due for a pilot in as few as 90 hours after the most recent 100-hour. The regulation is written this way so the 100-hour inspection doesn't become a 110-hour inspection with people using the 10 hours to extend the time between every inspection. Consider this scenario. Joe, a flight instructor at XYZ Flight School, adds 100 to the most recent 100-hour inspection to determine when the next 100 hours do. He then subtracts the current off on Hobbs time from the total and finds four hours remaining based on his calculations. He concludes he can legally complete his planned one and a half hour training flight with his student. By not looking at the previous 200 hour inspections, Joe missed that the most recent inspection was actually overflown by three hours. The three hours over from the most recent inspection must be included when computing the next 100 hour inspection. In this case, only 97 instead of 100 can be added to the Hobbs time from the most recent inspection. Joe's planned flight of 1.5 hours would result in exceeding the 100-hour inspection by 0.5. Remember, a pilot may only exceed 100 hours if the flight is en route to a place where the inspection can be conducted. So Joe's local training flight of 1.5 hours would be in violation of 91409B, as the flight presumably is departing from where the inspection can be conducted. The ATP airworthiness checklist is designed to make the 100-hour calculations easy and accurate by providing a formula that accounts for inspections that were overflown as well as for those that weren't. Here's how it works. Locate the two most recent 100-hour inspections in the airframe section of the Blue Maintenance Logbook. In this example, the most recent 100-hour was on 10:2808 and was conducted at 6583.6 hours. Looking further through the maintenance records, you'll find the 100-hour prior to the most recent was conducted on 9-16-08, about a month and a half earlier, at a Hobbs time of 6482.8. When you subtract the second most recent 100-hour from the most recent, you'll find the most recent inspection actually took place 100.8 hours after the previous inspection. This means the most recent inspection was overflown by 0.8 according to the provisions of 91409B. The amount overflown, 8 tenths of an hour in this case, must be included in computing the next 100 hours time in service. Only the difference, 99.2 hours, can be added to the Hobbs time of the most recent inspection to determine when the next one is due. When you add 99.2 to the Hobbs time of the most recent inspection, you'll find that the next 100 hour should occur at 6682.8. Step 3 of the ATP Airworthiness Checklist makes this calculation easy by determining whether the most recent inspection was overflown or not, and adding 100 to the Hobbs time of the most recent inspection if it wasn't, or 200 to the inspection prior if the most recent inspection was overflown. You should find that your calculation matches the number provided on the Aircraft Equipment and Inspection Guide in the front of the maintenance logbook. Compare the next 100-hour due date with the current off-on Hobbs times to ensure your planned flight can be completed. In this example, there are 63 hours remaining before the next 100-hour inspection, so a planned training flight or check ride can easily be conducted. Once you've concluded that the flight you're planning can be conducted in accordance with 91409, check the 100-hour inspection box complete and continue to verify the status of the other required inspections. If you're completing the airworthiness checklist prior to a check ride, the DPE may ask, how many hours until the next 100-hour? This way, you'll be able to demonstrate that you've made an accurate calculation. The next inspection on the AV8's checklist is the altimeter. For IFR operations, 91411 requires that each pressure system, altimeter instrument, and automatic pressure altitude reporting system must be appropriately tested and inspected within the preceding 24 months. Additionally, an ATC transponder cannot be used unless it's been tested and inspected within the preceding 24 months. Record of the transponder, altimeter, and pitot-static system checks can be found in the airframe section of the Blue Maintenance Logbook. Since these inspections occur every 24 months, you may have to look further back through the records than the other inspections to find them. 
The transponder inspection is usually accomplished concurrently with the required altimeter, encoder, and pitot-static inspections. A specifically equipped and authorized repair station must accomplish these inspections, so the log entries may appear different than the other inspections. In this example, the transponder, altimeter, pitot-static, and encoder inspections were all accomplished on May 2, 2007. Since the most recent inspection was in May of 2007, the airplane can be flown under IFR in an airspace that requires the transponder until the last day of May 2009, 24 calendar months past the most recent inspection. Mark these dates on the airworthiness checklist and verify they match the aircraft and equipment inspection guide. Since the altimeter, transponder, and static system can usually be found in the same maintenance entry, the final inspection required by Aviates is the ELT. 91207 requires airplanes to have an operable ELT in order to fly in the U.S. airspace system. To maintain the ELT in operable condition, the batteries must be replaced or recharged at regular intervals, and the ELT itself must be inspected every 12 calendar months. ELT batteries must be replaced or recharged if they're rechargeable when the transmitter's been in use for one cumulative hour or when 50% of the battery's useful life or charge has expired. When looking through maintenance records, some inspections can be difficult to find if you don't know what you're looking for. Some required inspections reference only the corresponding regulation and not the actual inspection name. In this example, the required ELT inspections were completed and logged correctly, but the log entry itself doesn't mention ELT. The log entry only references the appropriate FARs, 91207C and D. Add the dates from the ELT inspections and mark them complete on the ATP Airworthiness Checklist. Then verify that these dates match the dates listed on the Aircraft and Equipment Inspection Guide. Thanks for joining us for this lesson on required inspections. Using Aviates and the ATP Airworthiness Checklist, it's easy to accurately determine whether the required inspections have been completed.